So folks, I think, uh, I think we should continue on to the last part of the lecture today. Because uh, uh, up until now we've talked about uh, the customer needs, we've talked about how to formu formulate these needs in a very efficient way, and also we've talked about how to actually find out, find out how many customers we have of each type uh, in these segments. So all of this doesn't really matter if you don't have a credible uh, strategy for actually realizing this market, and that's what this uh, next part is about. Um, I'll start out by introducing something that's, uh, well, in the last lecture I talked about the value proposition, which is essentially a buzzword with uh, investors, something they, they want to hear in a presentation. Uh, this is something the, the investors want to see in a presentation. They want to see hockey sticks. I'll, uh, <laughs> obviously, I'll explain that further uh, as we go along. Um, the market potential has no value to an investor. Of course, what has value is um, the plan that's made available for realizing this uh, potential. So how are you actually going to sell to this market? How are you going to get into the market? How, when are you going to sell? And how much are you going to sell? Um, you need to answer the following questions, uh, questions for the investor to be happy. And this is where the uh, hockey stick comes into play. Of course, in the early part of the development, you'll, you'll uh, use more money than, uh, than you'll be uh, getting. At some point, you hopefully start selling, um, and um, that would be this point. Uh, and at that point, things should go only one way. The next important date is when are you actually going to break even? Uh, because uh, that's when uh, the investor can actually hope to begin get it, to get his money back at least the money he invested. But actually, to be real um, about it, the investor is looking at, uh, at this point here. That's uh, what you would call an exit opportunity or an exit point. Investors talk about exits because uh, that's when they go into a company, sorry. When they go into a company, they are always from day one looking at when will we go out of this company and how much money will we earn. So in this case, uh, what they need to invest is essentially the difference between that point and that point. And a bit further out, what they can take out of it is the difference between that point and that point. Well, essentially, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, simplifying it quite a bit. But um, as I said at, uh, in the first lecture, an investor will typically, if we're at this stage, will typically uh, look at a five-year plan to, uh, you know, increase his uh, investment by, uh, let's say, a factor of 10 or something. Uh, with some investors, maybe it's uh, seven, maybe it's six, maybe even less, but uh, that's something one should be ready about, ready for. So how do we go about planning this uh, hockey stick? Um, well, of course, also, this is about how much the shares can be sold for. Um, well, first of all, we need a solid execution st strategy. We need to know what segments we're going into and when we're going into these segments. Uh, we need to have a good knowledge of the customer and the market. Well, that's covered. That's what we did in the first lectures. And uh, finally, we need a credible sales approach. And it's the last part here that I'll be talking a bit more about in this, this lecture here. Um, this here is a, a typical uh, life cycle of a market. What you tend to see is that it's really hard to get uh, started. Um, you tend to sell to enthusiasts, think, uh, people who, well, you know, uh, early adopters, people who see the vision, the idea with the product, but it maybe doesn't have a track record, but they see that where it can go. And going on, you have a breakthrough and you start selling quite a bit. This is where it gets really interesting. Of course, that breakthrough is uh, you know, affected by the fact that you now have a track record from selling to the early adopters. And finally, the market, as it's you know, uh, fully saturated, uh, tends to you know, even out at a lower stage. That's, of course, you reach a stage where when you sell something that's new, it's because you sell uh, a product to someone who had it before, but it's now broken, or they need a new one. So that's a typical life cycle of, uh, 
of a, of a market. And, and similarly, you have the saturation of the market uh, here on the, the dashed line. So, of course, this is not a hockey stick. <laughs> so how do we go from this to a hockey stick? And I've tried to do this, but, you know, with, with limited success. Um, if you need to plan for continued growth, uh, and that, re that requires you to have uh, capital. You need to go into one segment, establish capital, have money in the bank, so that you can go into the next, cap uh, next segment, and the next segment, and the next segment. And following that approach, you can get, well, what resembles a hockey stick, doesn't it? Uh, by having an aggressive strategy for, okay, here we go into one segment, here we go into the next segment, and, and so forth. So that's why, how you need to think about the pins on the bowling alley. And doing that, of course, um, requires you to sell. And uh, this is really the crux of it. Um, sales are arguably the single most important factor to an investor. If you go to an investor and say, I've already sold 100 pieces, so I have pre-orders for this number of uh, products and I can deliver on this date, then they start listing because then they know it's, not, it's, it's a business and it's not a business idea because uh, business is about sales, earning money, or you know, creating an impact if we are a social business. Um, so um, as with the, the market research, you have uh, different approaches here uh, you can, uh, to describe the sales. Is it a bottom up or is it a top down? And uh, I'll try to elaborate on that. Uh, before, of course, going too much into that, one has to uh, think about where, where you're placed because uh, for tech products, uh, for instance, my wind turbine, I'm a business-to-business -business company. I sell to other businesses. So that's, uh, that's a whole set of uh, sales strategies for that particular type of work. Um, you have uh, a tendency you could sell um, to higher parts of the organization, for instance, the strategic level, and then you could actually sell a lot of units, or you could sell to a lower part of the organization and sell few units. Of course, uh, there's a trade-off there, because when you sell to the higher part of the organization, it tends to take a longer time. It tends to be, it takes to, it tends to be more complex, and it, it tends to uh, require more documentation and more descriptions. Of course, selling to the lower part of the uh, company or the operational level that's more of a, you know, a personal decision and someone usually sits both in the role of user and purchaser. So that's also a way of uh, you know, thinking about it. Um, and it's somewhat different if you're a, a business to a customer uh, kind of company selling directly to the end customer. Well, luckily, most, most of us here know how to do that because we're used to buying off of uh, websites and in shops and, uh, uh, well, uh, in, through distributors, partners. Uh, all of that is, is quite familiar to us. Uh, where it really gets dodgy and complex is when you have composite models, like down here. You have the Shopify group, for instance, who are involved with uh, selling products uh, to customers in a network um, by using the network, and uh, and who is actually uh, who are you going to sell this to? Maybe you have maybe you don't have any income on the actual sales, but you sell the um, uh, the knowledge gained from the sales to a third party, a company. So this third party would be a company. So that's a business to business strategy. But at the same time, you need to have a product that's attractive to the customer. So that's a business to customer strategy. So that's, uh, that's something one has to think very much about and, and try to land in the right place. Um, so we're back at the beer company, Company X. Um, and uh, what I'd like you to do now is uh, identify uh, a few sales approaches. And uh, I think Tom already uh, touched upon uh, some uh, strategies for doing that. I think also, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't put any up there. So, Looking at this, you know, you could sell to a higher level or a lower level. Who could you, uh, who, what could be a sales strategy for the company? Any ideas? Or maybe I should have done some examples first. But Tom, uh, Tom had an excellent example of, um, you know, selling to uh, the, uh, you said the, the foreman or to the you know, owner, owner of the company instead of selling directly to the, the workers at the construction site because then you would, in that case, you would be able to sell more beer and you would be able to relate 
the sale to the benefit gained from the workers being more efficient. And of course, also that has a business to customer uh, dimension because the end user uh, has to want the beer as well. So uh, you really sell on, on two levels. Of course, there's a very traditional uh, B2C business to customer approach to be found there as well. You could just send, uh, put it up in stores and, uh, and sell it through a distributor to uh, the end customer. You could even uh, consider having like a, a door to door sales approach where you go from uh, construction site to construction site and <laughs> you know, tap the workers on the shoulder and say, so do you need a case of beer today? So what I'm trying to exemplify there is that you have a lot of different approaches. You can go up, attack the same segment in many different ways. And of course, as always, this is important to you. This is important to your idea and you need to place yourself within this uh, framework, within this context and figure out where do we sell, how do we sell and to who do we sell. Um, one way of uh, figuring out how the sales process actually works is saying, uh, what does it take? What steps do we need to go through to actually uh, sell our product? And uh, this is a, an example that's based pretty much on a technology sale, like for instance, me selling a wind turbine to a company. Uh, I need to establish contact, first of all. Uh, I need to create some sales materials, something that they can look at and say, okay, this looks like a good idea. So if that works, uh, works out, maybe I can get to, in dialogue with the customer, specify a solution. And uh, after that, I'll probably have to formulate a quotation regarding <clears throat> how much it's going to cost them and uh, what exactly should be in the package we're selling. And finally, we can negotiate terms. Maybe that's with the procurement department or whatever. And uh, hopefully at the end of that, we'll have a sale. Each of these sales tasks uh, take time. And uh, one shouldn't uh, you know, forget the fact that it can take a lot of time. And a big part of the costs involved with each of your products is actually the sales costs. So for some of you, you could just sell it over a website. That's brilliant because then it's not really a cost. But for some others, maybe you have a lot of sales um, to you know, partners, to uh, the purchase, uh, the one doing the you know, purchase decision. So you'll have to figure that out. And that relates uh, to uh, the so-called sales funnel because uh, I mentioned this earlier. One thing is people being interested. The other thing is people actually buying. And what you tend to see is that, for instance, for a, for a technology like mine, my wind turbine, uh, I, had a, I sat on an investor meeting and he said, well, it all looks good, but you know what? I, don't believe, I, don't, I have no belief in your sales figures. He said, you'll have a hit rate from first meeting to actual purchase order. And that's you know, someone buying the turbine of maybe 8%. <laughs> that was a bit depressing. Uh, so I had to uh, figure out what that, uh, what that did to my market. And this is essentially what you have to be aware of. What does it say, take to get the first meetings? What does it take to uh, you know, qualify the leads to uh, find the ones that are actually attractive and who are going to buy? And what does it uh, take to close the leads? Those are all you know, time, uh, you know, resources that need to be paid for somehow. And in some cases, you can actually have the customer do this for you. So what if you just introduce your product to the customer and the customer actually spends the next few days looking at your website, seeing, okay, is this something for me? You provide the materials, but the customer, uh, the customers themselves uh, do the qualification part and uh, contact you when they actually want to purchase something. So you can think of many different ways of uh, you know, uh, doing this. What you end up with, regardless, is that you don't have the same number of sales as you have candidates. So essentially, this is a, an exercise in reducing these numbers here as much as possible. And uh, let's just uh, go into it uh, right away. Um, let's take uh, one of the segments here for uh, the non-alcoholic beer. Um, uh, what, what would be a good segment? Uh, let's take the, the pub goers, the people going to the pub and uh, wanting to drive home and uh, they can't drink beer, they can't drink alcohol because it's illegal. Uh, could, you, um, could you come up with some tasks that the, a salesperson would uh, have to go through to, to sell to, to these persons? 
or it could be on, on both to the person or to the pub. So any inputs on this? Yeah? First, they have to, um, to persuade the, the pub that they are actually going to buy this product into their pub. Mm -hmm. And then and they have to persuade them so much that they can also sell it to the next customer. Because when they're sitting at the bar and saying that they're not allowed to drink and they like a cola, uh, they're not allowed to drink because they have to drive, they, they have to make the salesperson or the, the bar person may become the salesperson uh, for the product to become the ambassador. Sure. So uh, definitely, I agree with what you're saying there. I think it's one very important step that uh, should be put in front of that is actually identifying the bar person. Uh, yeah. What you sometimes do is that, or what you could do is you could actually be at the bar so that you eliminate so for a period of time um, the bartender to be the salesperson. Um, and you so that you do the selling in the bar. Yeah. yeah. So uh, w the idea here is also that uh, you list a number of different tasks that need to be done. For, for you to perform each sale. And of course, this approach that you're uh, mentioning here is selling to the bar, you know, getting a, a deal with the bar instead of getting a deal with the customer. And that'll enable you to sell a lot of crates of beer instead of just one beer per, per customer. So that's, I think that's a, that's a wise way of going about it. Uh, but it also takes a lot more, you know, per, uh, convincing and it takes a lot more, uh, you know, uh, effort to convince a bar that they should uh, spend, let's say, 20,000 kroner on beer and not just a person spending, you know, 15 kroner on a beer. So that's, that's the trade-off one has to think about. But uh, that, also has to be weighed, that also has to be weighed in. Yeah? Could we also get all the drivers interested in getting this non-alcoholic beer and then they'll request it at the bar and the bar will see a demand for this and then buy a Sure, uh, you could have, uh, one thing is of course uh, man hours and, and human resources spending time on selling, but you could have like big billboards <laughs> by, the, by the freeway, couldn't you? Wouldn't you just want a beer right now? <laughs> Something like that, that would, that would work fine. And when they arrived, uh, you know, they drove past the pub, uh, there was a sign saying, we actually have be a beer you can drink right now. So <laughs> that would be one way of going about it. Oh really? Yeah, I, I don't re remember that, but that's uh, that's uh, that sounds uh, that sounds like a good way of going about it, doesn't it? <laughs> but the the point being here that uh, this all takes an effort. It all costs something, and you have to have okay. Are we going to uh, you know convince the drivers going to the pub that they should buy the beer when they get there? Like an, a subliminal message. It's not necessarily subliminal, but how do you do that? How much is it going to cost? So that's what the investor will want to hear. How do you affect the driver in a way that they actually do make the purchase decision as they arrive at the pub or drive by the pub? So, some other, yeah? Uh, totally different examples, uh, I hope it's okay. Um, as I've worked in an outdoor store, um, they have a tendency to uh, locate the um, important factors when selling, and that is uh, the sales personnel and in, uh, in the sales chain. chain. So the, the sales representative for the company actually went out uh, to the end, uh, to those who are going to sell in the shops and train them because if they have an impact on mm -hmm. them, just like when talking to the bartender uh, instead of just the manager, he can actually uh, influence the, mm -hmm. the, the purchase and the decision. Sure, definitely. So that's also another uh, you know, resource one has to take into account and, and you know, deduct from the overall uh, the overall uh, profits on your product. Uh, so, goes without saying, do this for your own product. <laughs> uh, can I add? Yeah, sure. Just make a couple of obvious in inputs here, which is um, you could always sell to the breweries and then they do the distribution for you. So you just tag on an, a non-alcoholic beer and also think about the locations of the place they're selling these, perhaps in rural areas where you have to drive to uh, the pub. You That's a good point. Yeah. You can't get there by public transport, or you can expect many people to be driving there. I have a question to that. Is it okay if you are a company and you sell to the brewery as they are the distributor, 
and uh, you are the small company, so that you at the same time also create create the demand, get all your friends out in the bars and asking for the product. Is that yeah, okay? Perfectly fine. It's just one way of going about it, isn't it? But again, this is about you know having an approach for doing the sales. And that would definitely be one way of going about it, you know, using your friends to actually go to the bars and, and create a demand. But that would cost you something, wouldn't it? Of course, if, if some of your friends would do it, but they'd do it once, they wouldn't be doing it like on a general basis all week long, you know? So, so it'll probably cost you something. And that's what this is about. How do we do it? How much is it gonna cost us? So, so uh, the other way of going about it is, of course, if you have this uh, sales method, I'll just, sorry, go back to this slide here. This can enable you to actually say, okay, I, we're, we're three guys. And if we go through this process with every single sale, you can actually get an idea of how many sales can we do per month uh, going through this process. And, uh, you know, having the hit rates in there as well, you can say, okay, how much are we going to sell then? And then you get a, can start building up sales figures. And as you sell, a number of units or a number of products or a number of services. You can start you know, ramping up, hire a new guy, and you can project sales. So you could do it essentially on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the next part here is about the opposite, seeing what someone else is doing. Uh, was there a hand? No, it wasn't a hand. Um, because uh, there tends to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of info on how much big companies sell, for instance. Uh, and this is again a, a case of uh, the mature markets being well, very well described and the not so mature markets being uh, not so well described. But um, what you're really expected to do is, okay, let's say you have a great new idea, you have a great new business model and you have a great team. So when you go out and talk to an investor, your ambition should always be to beat the guys who are already doing it. It should always be that we can match their sales and we can do it better. Because why are you sitting in front of the investor if you don't have that ambition? That should always be, always be your ambition because why are you on the market then if you don't want to be the best and if you don't have a strong uh, business model that can outcompete the others? And so that's, uh, that's one note that's important there. So going back to uh, Edgeflow, um, I'll just tell you a bit about how I've forecasted uh, sales for my company. Actually, I've done it on, 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 on two levels. I've done the bottom up. As you can see here, I did a huge Excel sheet where I essentially went through all the required tasks for selling. I said, okay, I have this company A, company B, company C, and I'm this far with company A, so I need to go through these steps. I'm this far with company B, so I need to go through these steps. And essentially what I ended up with was a number of dates and a number of you know, sales uh, at some point during these uh, different, uh, these different uh, uh, processes. And that enabled me to say, okay, how much, what is realistic for me to sell at an early stage? And of course, that's the early stage, but what do you do then if you uh, go on to the later stage? Uh, there I adopted a slightly different approach. I did a, a top-down approach looking at one of our main competitors. And uh, it turned out that uh, if uh, I looked at, let's say this competitor one here, uh, I figured out that they were um, uh, actually saying a lot about themselves in, in media and they were being mentioned in articles, things like that, reports. And uh, that was something that I could uh, use because, for instance, uh, I looked at uh, one article saying, okay, they sold this many and another one, large order, blah, 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 and so forth. And by doing that, I actually got some market intelligence and I could kind of work out, okay, what are they selling and how much are they selling? And of course, my ambition for my company, when I'm standing in front of an investor is saying that this is a good product, company one. My product is much better. I have a much better business plan. I have a much better plan for execution. So this is the minimum requirement for my sales. And that's perfectly believable to uh, an investor because they're looking at your business model. They're looking at your sales strategies and saying, okay, this seems feasible. This seems believable. So, uh, so that's, that should be your amb ambition always. And I think actually that's, that's pretty much it for today. So um, any questions at this point? Must be really tired because <laughs> it's been a, a few long lectures here. But uh, thanks for that. Um, going on to uh, Friday, you should, uh, of course, remember where you are in the process, in this double diamond process. You're, uh, you're in the sort of the problem definition phase where you need to work on your 
uh, mission statement and your problem definition, and also following what you've learned today, look into these points here. Specify rate segments, you know, need to figure out what the customer needs are for these different segments. And I know this doesn't correspond to the chronology of this lecture, but uh, this is how I do it in that order. I wanted the customer research stuff to come in first because Tobias was lecturing, so that's the reason it didn't come before, so, sorry, after the market. Uh, and start formulating a value proposition because you'll be asked for a value proposition very soon when you, you'll be pitching and when you're selling your, um, selling your concept and your idea to different stakeholders. You need to be very, very good at communicating what it is you do and why it has a value to the customer. So that's all for today. Thank you very much. See you Friday.